I'm Anne Lapel. I am the chair of the Montclair Senior Citizens Advisory Committee. And I'm very happy to see this group here because today you're going to learn some very interesting things. Hopefully things that we can all benefit from. Today we're celebrating the changing landscape in Montclair. And I see a lot of people here who know that the landscape has changed because they've been here more than 30 years. Montclair seniors over the age of 60 have seen remarkable and positive changes over the past 10 years. This, this has been largely due to five years of enormous effort by Katie York, who's in the back. Katie? <laughs> Katie is the director of the Division of Senior Services Life Long Montclair, which is a part of the Montclair Department of Health and Human Services. Katie has worked collaboratively with the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee, with numerous volunteer organizations, and with 32 other lifelong Montclair partners. And here's the good news. Here's what we can report now. The operative question in Montclair nowadays for seniors is not what is there to do on a given day, but which of the competing programs gets my attention. We are proud to celebrate that and to enumerate some of the highlights. Montclair Institute for Lifelong Learning, or fondly called the Mill, was founded in 2015. It is a grant-funded adult education program that has exceeded expectations. It's tailored to the specific, excuse me, to the specific and creative tastes of Montclair's older residents. Enrollment in more than 250 classes has approached 1,500 a year. That is remarkable. And a testament to Katie's genius. And because of the generation, excuse me, because of the generosity of the Partners for Health Foundation, Montclair Township, and matching grants for residents, the mill is free. Now we're going to play a little bit of fill in the blank as we go along, see if you can figure it out. We celebrate the senior bus. Our bus is green and free transportation and it operates weekdays through a dispatcher. That means the bus picks seniors up at their doorsteps and drops them at designated stops around the town. Remember that old slogan? leave the driving to us? Well, Montclair senior bus riders can also leave the hassles of parking to them. One of the main advantages in taking the senior bus. And I, did I mention that because of the township support, riding on the senior bus is, fill in the blank. All right. Another one of our showcases, Edgemont Park House, is a town-funded nexus for senior-friendly exercise, pinochle, crafts, educational programs, group trips, sponsored lunches, and fun. And there's no membership requirement. Drop in any time. And by the way, it's free. And there are additional opportunities for social and educational invo involvement in partner sites like the Do Drop In at the Wally Troy Center, the Senior Space at Montclair Public Library, the AIM Hub here in the Salvation Army, and the YMCA of Montclair. We also have the Senior of the Month. Over 30 people have been honored since the program was launched in May 2017. This program acknowledges our friends and neighbors who share only one thing in common. They were all born between, excuse me, before 1964. And of course, being an honoree is free. Okay. We have the Blue Angel Lockbox Program that is designed to facilitate police, fire, and ambulance and emergency entry into the homes of older residents while still maintaining each individual's confidentiality. If you know anyone, who may be a little bit um, afraid of how they're going to manage if an emergency occurs. By contacting Katie's office, they can arrange to have one of these boxes 
put on their uh, front door and the code will be only held by the people who will keep it securely so that you'll know that they're safe if some emergency happens. We don't want another Hurricane Sandy, but you never can tell. And the lock boxes are free. Okay. Montclair joined the Age-Friendly Community Network, an AARP and World Health Organization affiliation. This effort bespeaks age-friendly goals. Montclair's municipal support for age friendliness has been the key to the flowering of so many of the services and programs that have emerged in the last five years. The short list of assets that I just enumerated are focused on the needs of older rest rest residents. But not least of our assets is the Montclair Senior Citizens Advisory Committee, or SCAC. For 30 years, this advocacy and educational committee of town appointed peers has advised the township about the needs of its older residents and researched new age friendly opportunities for town wide consideration. That's the issue that brings us here today. How to make sure our residents have access to local housing options that are state of the art in terms of safety and sustainability. This is not a new issue, but one that is gaining traction of late. You've heard of child proofing? Well, this new awareness has surfaced. The new awareness is people of all ages deserve to live in homes that optimize living, not restrict it. It has been said that people do not have physical cha challenges, but environments do. Today, our expert presenters will explain how universal design can transform our environments. With a little bit of forethought, our living environments can be shaped so that everyone enjoys a sustainable quality of life. Universal design, or UD, especially makes it possible for older residents to age in place. That is, to remain living in homes that are safe and accessible for as long as they want to stay. On the practical side, did you know that the IRS has identified several universal design improvements for which the full cost can be reported as a medical expense tax deduction? I don't have the enumeration of all of these improvements, but here's a snapshot. Constructing, constructing entrances or exit ramps for the home, widening interior or exterior doorways, installing railway support bars or other modifications, installing, installing stair lift, um, staircase lifts. As you absorb what we have as information presented today, keep in mind that if you decide to make some improvements in your home, you might be able to have a welcome tax deduction on your next tax return. So why would the IRS extend these environmental deductions to citizens? Simply because having older folks age in their communities saves the government lots of money in the long run. It adds to the quality of life of our older citizens and reduces health costs. We have proof of it, lots of studies. UD empowers us to remain as independent as possible in an optimized home environment. UD provides construction guidelines for sustainable living. The same UD standards that benefit older residents benefit children and residents who experience sports injuries or unexpected physical challenges. UD is often a requirement in new construction. However, in first ring suburbs like Montclair, where building new is not always possible, it is incumbent upon our leadership to encourage universal design as part of the planning and zoning processes for retrofitting. UD has the potential to guide retrofitting of existing houses and thereby ensuring safety in the physical structure, ensuring safety in streets, for example, street lighting, sidewalk configuration, barrier-free entries, 
To accomplish the goal of aging in place, communities must rethink how to make their housing stock accessible to all people. Our community diversity and stability will benefit from it. So how do we get where we want to go? Today's pre presenters will inform us, inform us as well as challenge us to think differently about our housing and our streetscape. Sustainable communities of the future have to be green in construction as well as location, designed to reduce dependence upon fossil fuels by supporting pedestrian or bike traffic, provide access to public transportation, green spaces, and shops, we know that thoughtful design can reinforce respect for our neighbors, encourage fellowship in caring communities, and create pleasing architectural landscapes. Construction is not only about building houses, but about building sustainable, age-friendly homes. Today, you'll hear our presenters discuss an overview of the universal design concept the architectural objectives in home design, and the use of universal design in intentional community planning. Before we get to our speakers, a little housekeeping before I go on. Our presentations will be followed by video interludes. These videos were provided by our showcase vendors. We encourage you to visit their vendor tables in the gym to ask questions and gather information about their sustainable living solutions. And finally, no conference of this scope can be undertaken without dedicated volunteers. Some of the volunteers are wearing um, tags. There are a lot of people wearing tags because it takes a lot of people to bring about something like this. We're lucky that we have the steering committee, the Seniorama organizing committee, and a lot of volunteers who've helped us put this together. And I want to thank them heartily right now. And conferences cannot be implemented like this unless there is some financial support. I want to th thank the following who have generously con contributed. Our sponsors, the Township of Montclair and the Partners for Health Foundation, and our supporters, Salvation Army, Tony's Kitchen, Montclair Film, Montclair Police Department, and Barbara Chase. So, Our, our presentations. For our first presentation, an overview of UD, we have two individuals who have a very, very rich understanding of UD planning. We have Steve Leone, who is from Spicel, did I pronounce that right? Spicel Architectural Group. He is a senior level award-winning design professional with over 30 years of experience in the field of architecture and an extensive background in senior living, healthcare environments, and sustainable design. And to tell you how old I am, he was a student at NJIT when I worked there. <laughs> and we have Jack Carmen. Jack is a landscape architect with over 30 years of experience in the analysis, planning, design, and management of outdoor spaces. As a design consultant, Jack has specialized in creating therapeutic exterior environments for senior communities and health care facilities. I'd now like to thank and welcome our two presenters, Steve Leone and Jack Long. Uh, but one way that we were brought together was uh, in 
both of us founding a group um, that goes by the acronym of LEAP, L-E-A, two P's. Uh, and that acronym stands for a Life Enrichment Aging in Place Professionals. Um, the group is essentially focused on trying to develop strategies, whether it be with um, organizations or communities and municipalities, and trying to develop ways to enrich existing communities and implement strategies within those existing communities to um, further uh, provide accessibility and enrichment for seniors. Uh, and that is very clearly based within existing communities. It isn't as much about talking about new communities or communities that are developed by organizations to, to bring people off-site uh, to what we qualify as the, the cruise ship ideas, but actually working with communities like Montclair. Montclair is a fantastic example of that collaboration, but finding ways to assist those groups in uh, developing those strategies to enrich the lives of, of elders. So LEAP is how uh, Jack and I uh, further our work and, and our passion for the senior living uh, spectrum. So it's a good tie-in, it's a good way to, to bridge both disciplines of architecture and landscape architecture, and my perspective is engaging people to get outside, and, and how do we do that effortlessly? So I think, oh wait, how many people are familiar with universal design have heard of it? Okay, it's good, a majority. What's the difference between universal design and, um, let's see, which one? Yeah. Universal design and technology. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is ADA? American, American Disabilities Act. That is a. I'm going to use what Ann did. I'll fill in the blank. What's it? What's it called? It's a law, right? It's something we need to follow. What is universal design? That takes it to the next step, doesn't it? Universal being comprehensive, that inclusive, that everyone uh, participates in. Right, so we're all we all in, we all experience it the same way. So that's kind of just a lead into where we're going. And Anne, I think, gave a great introduction to our talk and the other talks. And I think what we don't really, I know we will say something, but I think the pictures will reinforce what Anne just described uh, to you. And just to add something to that, to be to be clear, universal design is not something you should be uh, weary of. It isn't something that isn't particularly sophisticated. Uh, the graphic there is, is kind of all telling. It is really a, a way to address the needs of everyone. Now, we're speaking in specifically with regard to seniors, but it is, in fact, for everyone. So think more broadly. But I hope what you'll take away is examples that we can show you that are, are very simple to implement in some cases, in many cases, and others that require a little bit of collaboration, whether it be with uh, opportunities with funding organizations or with municipalities. Okay. So, in, we're not going to read all these through. We're going to uh, reinforce these as we go through. But there are seven principles, and we'll try and articulate and describe those. So, the first principle is equitable use. What, is, what does that mean to you? What is it? The principle is that, it, it, looking at 1A, provide the same means of use for all, correct? So what happens, as an example, and, and we talked about older buildings and so forth, or the, the reference to, you typically have stairs. Is there a ramp? Anne talked about maybe retrofitting homes and adding a ramp and so forth. Universal Design looks at that concept and says, everyone moves through the space the same way. So can you get rid of the stairs and just use a ramp as, as one example? Um, another way is incorporating seating. So if someone's in a wheelchair, a lot of times you go into a movie theater, where's where the seating for someone in a wheelchair? Typically in the back. <laughs> so we're using examples from Disney. Disney's been able to incorporate a lot of these things throughout their theme parks. But in a place like this theater in um, Epcot, the, the wheelchair accessible spaces are scattered throughout. So they would be scattered in this room. It's not all just in the back. One of the things, too, that we work very hard to do is to, to um, support that idea of equity uh, across all populations. And as I like to use the word, um, you doing that in a, a way that's rather stealth. Uh, so if, uh, for example, access to a swimming pool ordinarily uh, would require in a retrofit condition 
a device, an electrical device, a mechanical device that you are to be seated in and then brought over the, the, the bow of the pool and then lowered in. That, that isn't particularly equitable to anyone else who can just wander into the pool or jump into the pool. So strategies such as this example where there's a ramp that just guides you right into the, to the pool. So you're essentially just guiding yourself in without the need of a, of a device that A is going to be completely uncomfortable, perhaps even painful, um, and certainly undignified. So um, there are many strategies. In this particular case, it was, a, it was a new construction, so it was easier to implement. But uh, looking for ways to create that level of equity that's rather stealth and, and just feels kind of natural without um, creating any special um, uh, in influence or identity to it. Second uh, principle, flexibility in use. This is, uh, again, looking at Disney uh, and uh, Animal Kingdom. But it's a choice and method of use. So what they try and do, if you're in a wheelchair or a walker or some assistive device, you have the same means of access, visual in this case, of seeing the animals in the landscape. So how does that translate into our everyday use? And again, certainly easier to do a new construction, um, and, but requires a little bit more thought within existing context. But uh, if you can read some of the notes there, yeah, actually, you probably can't because I can't read them. Uh, but offering variation in choice, uh, altering counter heights, looking at uh, placing uh, the uh, rather standard kitchen appliances, for example, like microwaves and cooktops and such, at places where they occur somewhere in between the heights that we're accustomed to. This is all. This is is essentially altering conventional thought, the way builders, designers, uh, building inspectors view things as the norm. That's the easy way to go about things because that's what they've we've all grown up with. Um, but just taking a very uh, simplistic alternative look at offering variety, if we were to take the folks out of these particular images, take the wheelchairs out of the images, you probably would walk into any of these environments and not really notice that there's a difference. Uh, and you'd be completely fine with uh, having engaged in conversation with someone who was either in or not in a wheelchair. Uh, and of course, that is only one aspect of it, but um, not very difficult really to do it. To implement. So we take it to the outside, the exterior environment, and within the town or wherever we are, but again, you know, in this case, Disney. Um, I just came back from Disney, so that's why I'm here. Okay? In case you were wondering. I'm reliving my vacation, okay? Sorry, you have to sit through this. Um, but if you're going to go up to a counter, can't everyone be treated the same way so the counter height is lower? So someone, again, that may be in a wheelchair or whoever has access to it, if someone doesn't have to say, what do you want? I'll go get it for you. You can go up and do it yourself. Or the flexibility of it's wide enough in the front that enough people, and they have masses of people coming through there, but there's also stairs off to the side if you need to use it that way. So it's a balance of uses and abilities. And sometimes what we have to recognize is on our end, uh, what we try and implement um, design strategies that are not typical, that are uh, a little bit odd for folks that have to review them or accept them, i.e. perhaps a building department, is just challenging that kind of commonplace idea and just making the case. And sometimes it takes a little extra effort, um, but that's really all that it's about, to sort of just guide people through what is standard and what is maybe not standard, but uh, more um, uh, friendly to the, to the actual users. Uh, so the challenge there is just a matter of education, really. Principle three, uh, simple and equitable use. Eliminating unnecessary complexity, um, a wide range of literacy skills, and so forth. And, and if you're looking, a step back, if you're looking for any of this information, you can go to the website for Universal Design, um, University of North Carolina. They're different places, but that's pr primarily where it comes out of. So if you're trying to get this information, it's all online, it's all available. But again, so when you're walking around in signage, or maybe in this case it's, uh, and it's a little bit hard to see exactly, but first aid, what does it say? How do you get there? You're stressed. It tells you quickly and easily and allows you to understand what's going on or what you need to know. 
Um, maybe in the case of a place to, to pull up and sit. So at Epcot, they created a little sitting area off to the side where someone can go. You clearly understand what it is, the chairs um, and so forth. It says you can come in and rest. So it's things that are easily understood, um, comprehend, comprehended. Principle four, perceptual information, perceptible information. I, we have, I know we have too many signs. I'm not going to argue against that. But maybe we can consolidate. Maybe we can make them clearer. Maybe, maybe we can create signs that are easier to understand and so forth. And for people of all abilities. So if someone may be colorblind, they may be blind, having braille, having large enough print, um, all of these things need to be. And as Steve said, Maybe it's out of the norm. Maybe it's um, something that a reviewer doesn't understand, but it's getting them to understand that these things are needed for, as Ann said, people of all abilities, all ages. I, again, looking at different signage, but you know, this the sign on the right is um, a layout of one of the areas at Disney Springs, and the other is a, a sign directing you where to go. Is it easy to now? You know, coming into a town, you start using GPS, as I do, and so forth, traveling around. It may be helpful, it may be not. Maybe street signs need to be bigger. Maybe, maybe they need to be um, better backlit when it's at night and seeing things. So it, it's thinking outside of the box a little bit and starting to look at each individual item and question how is it being used. Tolerance for error. Um, it, it, it's, uh, I, again, looking at things and saying, is this going to be a tripping hazard? Is there something that may be unsafe about this? So in this case, what did they do? There's a, right in front of the trash can, I think you can see that there's a manhole cover. Well, they colored it the same as the pavement. So it doesn't say, you know, if you're carrying something or maybe you're not steady on your feet, you see something that's maybe a little bit taller than something else or a different color, you may think it is, it may even subconsciously think it's a tripping hazard, step out of the way, lose your balance. By helping things blend in and, and clearly identifying, it makes it safer and easier to use. One, one uh, little personal anecdote there, I was telling Jack a little bit earlier, I, I had a personal example of, of something like that. And I, I restructured a deck this past summer in my backyard and the architect, of course, being very diligent about hard geometries, um, in my mind, the, there are certain rules to establishing the criteria and the, and the sight lines for the deck. Well, at one point, my wife came out and thought that this, this one corner where there was a step was potentially uh, a bit of a problem, um, a tripping hazard. And the architect said, absolutely not. The geometry cannot be sacrificed. Please, please lead me to my work. Um, to which then, shortly thereafter, I tripped over that very area. <laughs> so then I obviously had to come up with an idea to, uh, to mitigate that problem. And uh, I was struggling with that as the architect. I had to come up with some real clever way to, to address that. And to which my wife answered, why don't you just put a potted plant right there? <laughs> and the potted plant is there today and it works beautifully because it's a signal. It just, it's, you see it, it's three dimensional and you know that you've got to get yourself around it. It isn't even anything, it's not even anything that you consciously are aware of. You just kind of move around that and thereby mitigate the tripping hazard. And it also has to do a little bit, and I'll say, think about maintenance and so forth. You know, okay, this is Disney, everything's perfect, all the lines are painted, freshly painted and so forth, but maybe those are the kind of standards we need to start to look at so that people can see clearly what's the center of the road or if you're driving, maybe it's that yellow stripe on the side so you can clearly see at night, or even at night, reflectors and so forth so you can clearly, clearly see. So it's, again, it's a little, as Steve said, details, maybe it can be fixed by a potted plant, I don't know, but we need to look at those things. Um, minimum effort, so ADA says a ramp 5%. I don't know how many people have tried to push someone in a wheelchair up a ramp that's 5%, but it can be difficult. It can be physically straining to do. Universal design says you, you need to rethink that. Maybe the slope should be 2% and maybe make it easier. So how do we work these things into the design? How do we retrofit? How do we make things work better for people in general? 
So just looking at, you know, I'm, I now follow people around in wheelchairs, okay? I, in airports, I can get arrested, especially with TSA today. I mean, for a while, I was doing that. I was measuring wheelchairs just to see the, the height of the seats, and I figured that's not safe to do. I've had to vouch for a jacket once or twice before at <laughs> <the> police station. <laughs> Um, so again, keep those things in mind. Uh, safe approach and so forth, clear approach. Again, they, they almost become so simple that we, we have to say, well, why didn't somebody say that before? What we have is just articulating that. It's putting it down in writing and it's calling it to your attention and saying, how do you clearly define the entrance? An entrance that looks like an entrance that you know, you know, whether it's the entrance to a movie theater or wherever it is, you know what it is, you know how to go in there. And, and back to the idea of disability perception, um, very simple ways of addressing um, ways to facilitate access. So, uh, not particularly clear in this photo, but um, you can use that with colors and with shapes and with lighting. Natural lighting is obviously the, the best introduced to really understand the space that, you, that surrounds you. Uh, putting a, a, a bright chroma color on one wall and the head wall that just immediately associates you with that being the front of the room and you know the, what devices are attached to that front of the room. Um, things such as, as grab bars. Now, grab bars are, are a, a very controversial topic and I know that a lot of folks resist introducing grab bars, but I, I personally think that there are a number of ways to cleverly conceal or make them become just part of the, of the accessorizing of the space. Uh, and those grab bars can certainly become towel holders. Jack and I were talking about that earlier today. And, and actually beautify the space and become, uh, again, become stealth. The grab bars, and you know what the real, purposes of, uh, real purpose of them is, but they're concealed by decor um, and, and don't become so particularly intrusive in the space. And, and, and that applies outside as well. So maybe a split rail fence becomes a handrail, but it doesn't have to look like a handrail. How do we make things easy for people and, and safe, safer? One of the key things, a friend of ours, Amy Kyoto from Japan, would walk around and say, where's the bathroom? You walk around the town, where do you go to the bathroom? Not right now, but you know where they're down the hall. That was a public service announcement for you. Um, but you know, if you are, the nice part about, okay, theme parks, or I was just in a, a shopping mall, the bathrooms are clearly identified where you go. Walk around town, and you need to use a bathroom, where do you go? Do you have to pay someone to go in there? Do you have to buy a cup of coffee or whatever? Why can't we somehow creatively find ways to do things like have public bathrooms that make it easy for people to and spend time somewhere? And one of the things that uh, our LEAP group uh, has done uh, in the past, that is to, to, to assess the communities and find ways that maybe could be facilitated and even speak to or bridge a kind of dialogue between the municipality and uh, community groups as well as the municipality and um, providers and, and uh, retail establishments. So why couldn't there be a policy that's developed or part of a tax structure developed with incoming um, uh, businesses that suggest there's the bathrooms are provided as they are by code for the, for the business itself, but that they could become accessible to the general public. Why, is, why would that be particularly difficult to do? Um, so part of what we hope to do is to, to have that dialogue and to try to find ways to, to implement that sort of policy. So with those, that is a foundation. We want to also throw a couple other ideas out to you about just general applications of some of these principles and how to take things a little bit further and, and look at things. So. In, a, in a, a downtown setting like this, um, you can clearly see from the picture of uh, clearly delineated crosswalks, um, lighting, and so forth and so on. And we'll start talking about some of those elements. What's probably one of the hardest things to do, and not just for older adults, but, well, okay, I'll take a step back too. I grew up in Staten Island, spent a lot of time in Manhattan. A spectator sport for me is kind of like dodging traffic, right? Getting across the street. My wife won't walk with me across the street because I don't pay attention to the cars. I say, let them stop. <laughs> Some people are getting nervous so far. It's worked out. So it has so far. We made it for a couple of years. We'll see how, how much longer it goes for. But the point is, we're the pedestrians. I, I'll get on my soapbox now. We have the right 
and you know, you get in your car, and it's like, I'm bigger than you are. But no, I, I remember the movie um, was Dustin Hoffman was pounding on the the the, uh, the hood of the car, going, what was it? Um, I'm walking here, so it we need to take control back uh, as a pedestrian. And how do you safely cross the road? And and what's the timing and so forth? And what do we need to do to just make that safer in general? There are some elements we can do. Maybe the crosswalks need to be timed a little bit longer. You can use a, maybe an activated card that you hold up next to a signaling device that allows for longer crossing time. Some communities use a flag um, that you can use to cross the road so a, a car can see you easier. Maybe in some towns, Rochester, I think Minnesota, a couple cities are now having fun with the crosswalks where they're painting them. Um, as keyboards, DOTs, Department of Transportation, don't like that for some reason, but as Steve said, maybe thinking outside of the box and getting people to do something a little bit different, it also makes it fun, too. It makes it interesting, and maybe that'll get a driver to pay attention a little bit more. And not to completely villainize uh, those, that, that, those of us that drive, um, <laughs> we could also implement strategies that just are more helpful to the driver so that it becomes more evident to the driver that something different, something unique is happening at that particular location that requires their attention, requires them to slow down. And if I happen to get your attention as a driver, what happens? You, in paying attention, you start to slow yourself down. You start to kind of pull back on the activity that you're engaged in because something else has caught your attention. And they call them now the terms of traffic calming devices, so how do you slow the traffic down? Things like um, speed humps uh, are used, uh, islands in the road. But then also at the top left in London, they're looking at LED lights in the crosswalks that stay lit while you're in the crosswalk. So again, it's, why not start thinking about applying technology? We have the capabilities, it may cost a little bit of money, but if we start to use it and we show that it saves lives, Maybe it becomes part of law that you have to do some of these things to make it safer. Or, okay, I mentioned islands and so forth uh, for crossing there, so it makes it, it, it gives you a little bit more time to cross, but I think one of the things that's missing from this picture would be a bench there in that island. So if someone needed to rest, they have the place to sit down and do that. It is wide enough to, to be able to do that. And to the point of cost, um, we, we all know this, that there's only a premium on something until it becomes commonplace. And then it becomes a more normalized cost. The cost nonetheless is more normalized. It isn't a premium any longer, whether it be your computer or whether it be more standardized streetscapes that look like this. I, I know I keep picking on Disney, but they're a fun, fun person, they're a fun, fun entity to pick on. But they do some things right, and I think they do them very well. At celebrations on the left-hand side of the screen, we have wider sidewalks, we have benches, we have more landscaping, we have shade trees. Uh, the top right is from Bainbridge Island out in Seattle. The retail shopping center has awnings over it or coverings so that if you don't want to be in the sunlight, it's shaded a certain amount so it's just safer, calmer, cooler, uh, more pleasant space to be in. Um, and then, uh, uh, other thing, we, we've been talking about older adults and so forth, but then what about other needs? Um, autism. And in the right hand side, they developed an app for, uh, pe for children or uh, people with autism to be able to safely navigate the city. Uh, what about hearing? Uh, background noise and so forth. Uh, we could use, what about using apps? I talked about maps before. What about using an app on your phone to be able to tell you to get around? Or that tells you how quickly the bus is coming? You know, there, again, there's so many things we could, we're just trying to throw a couple ideas out and get you thinking in that direction. Lighting at night, um, I hate winter. I, well, I'm getting used to it a little bit more, but it's dark at five o'clock, right? I really love the summertime. So, okay, I have to grow up and get used to it. It's gonna happen, I can't change it. But why can't we have better lighting at night that makes it easier to see? What about, again, technology, having light embedded in sidewalks and crosswalks, just as the other LED crosswalk showed, but having better and better lighting. Maybe 
Maybe we need to increase the foot candles in the, in the light fixtures. Or again, embed them in the, in the ground, in the sidewalks. Uh, shopping centers with newer, newer construction may be a little bit easier. Again, harder to retrofit with existing, but it can be done. Different colored crosswalks. This is the bottom right is a, a new food store in a shopping center, but the red sidewalk shows crossing as opposed to the darker colored asphalt for the, the drive aisle or no curb. So, but bollards will stop the cars, but at least you can pull up closer to the curb, and if you get out, there's not a tripping hazard. Now, now one of the things to, to reinforce is that we shouldn't be hesitant or concerned about pushing back when projects do come online, when large developments, retail developments such as these might, might come online. Uh, be vocal uh, and challenge the status quo and, and get past even, even the folks that are representing you and your municipalities to say, Look, we, we, need, we know that there are more clever ways to do this. The, the designers are not shy about uh, being clever and coming up with new ideas. They really aren't. It's when they get beaten down by the status quo that they kind of yield and give in. But you know, you can tell what kind of retail establishments these might be, and I've seen some really remarkable, even artistic, uh, ways of addressing uh, things such as uh, traffic patterns and slowing those traffic traffic patterns down, things as simple as bollards. Um, you know, there are really unique ways to do that. And the designers aren't really, in, in most cases, the impediment. Uh, it's just, again, what is recognized as being commonplace and sort of the easiest, most tried and true way to get through something. But it's not, it doesn't always necessarily serve our best interest as citizens or even the municipalities. It has to do with the health, safety, and welfare of the general public. That's the bottom line. Katie said that we have, we can go another hour? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Paul, Paul, just, Paul, Paul is going to throw things at us here in two seconds. So we've only, we have about two minutes to wrap it up, but we'll try and go through a couple of these other pictures and just, again, give you ideas. Reinforce the idea of public bathrooms, please, public bathrooms. <laughs> Landscaping, nature, we're hardwired to nature. Why can't we have better shopping centers, better streetscapes? that incorporate more plantings and so forth. Even in one shopping center, they give tours um, of the plants there. Uh, Minnesota, looking at um, towns, uh, the city that's inclusive, so it is, an, it is a dementia-friendly community. People are safe within the whole community. So again, you can go to these websites. You, you can find out more information just trying to get ideas across. AARP, great resource, a lot of good information. The idea of um, a 20 minute village, everything is within 20 minutes of where you are. And I think we can do that. Intergenerational playgrounds, um, people of all ages. This is actually up in Ithaca, New York. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic playground. Community gardens, there's a program in Scotland that says every, every square foot in the town is developed as a garden, and you can pick and have whatever is there. So they grow things for the community good, and they encourage you to do that for other people. And then the last couple ones, um, again, just reinforcing nature. There are health benefits. I'm, I'm always selling nature. I can't make money off of it because it's free, but it's good for you. That's the takeaway. Go take a walk in the park. It's good for reducing stress, lowering blood pressure. Doctors are writing prescriptions today for their patients to go walk in the park. It's called the Park Rx program. Six reasons to go for a walk. I think this is videotaped. The, the program will be available. You can go through these things again after. But again, it's a nice day. Go outside. Not right now. Later on, but go spend time outside. And, and, and don't wait for the doctor to prescribe a walk in the park. I don't think we really need to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I think they're encouraging questions a little bit later, so I don't, it's not that I don't want to answer, but I think Ann will, will be here to answer questions.
I said we have a very active timekeeper in the back, so we're trying to keep on schedule. All right. Uh, we're going to have a video now that was actually prepared by NJ Tip. Um, Lewis is here. Okay. If you haven't gone on one of the NJ Tip training programs, you really should consider it. They were here two years ago and did a huge training program on how to use public transportation. And believe it or not, even though New Jersey doesn't have a lot of public transportation, Montclair has very good opportunities. We've got five railroad stops. We've got buses that go into New York. May not go to the shore, but they go into New York. And we've got access to the senior bus. So they have gone around to all the towns in New Jersey, not all, many, and done training programs. And what you're going to see is a training, a video from a training program that was done in Westwood. Okay. My name is Shirley Crute. I live in the Westwood house. I'm a Jane and I, I'm a living at the Westwood. And you live in Westwood? Okay. So tell me why you ladies signed up to come on this trip today. Shirley? Well, I usually take the bus to um, Manhattan and um, I usually take a cab to Newark Airport. And now I have learned a lot of different ways to get to Newark Airport. And I found out that you can go to the beach. So you'll go to the beach? Yes, now? absolutely. How exciting. Yes, it's exciting. And um, you see all of the maps. I, I'm going to go through all of these <laughs> and see what exciting places I can visit. That's when I'm downtime, it's going to be great. What did you learn today that you didn't know before? Uh, how to purchase tickets um, for seniors, um, what stops to get off at, different tracks, uh, uh, directionals, um, and everything. And the way it was explained and our tour made it extremely easy for me to understand. And everything was very detailed and organized, and I loved it. Nice. And what about you, Jane? I agree with everything you should say because that's what I was looking for for Newark Airport, how to go to New York because I have to go there every other week, and they take a bus. So it's good to know a new option, you can have it. So that's why I'm here to learn, and I really appreciate all your efforts for that and I, everything worked very well. So do you think you'll be getting on the train again soon? Oh, oh yes, absolutely. Sure. Great. Yes. Yes. Well, it was yes. such a pleasure having you ladies on the trip with us. And, Thank you. And I'm, I'm really glad you were able to be there. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you. So please tell me your name. My name is Stacy Pappas and I'm from Westwood. Terrific. And? Uh, I'm Melanie and I live in Westwood House in Westwood. I came on the trip because I wanted to learn more about how to be self-independent using the train to get to different locations within New Jersey or wherever and not depend on other people to bring me around. Well, I'm 90 now and my daughter's wanting me to give up driving, which I'm still doing. Uh, so I figured pretty soon I might have to give up driving. Ah, so so I better figure out how to go places. The learning experience. Being with a lot of uh, ladies who are uh, in our age category <laughs> and uh, who are very interesting and still having fun in life. Terrific. And learning new things. Do you have any advice for any other older adults who might want to try using New Jersey Transit? Yeah. Sure. Get out and learn. Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies. I really appreciate you letting me interview you and being on the trip today. Thank you. Just here to um, say that New Jersey Transit, the NJ TIP program, changed the lives of many seniors here in Westwood. But for me personally, it made such a huge difference. Um, I'm a big chicken. I don't like to travel anywhere by myself. And I had gone on the NJ trip training with seniors from Westwood. And the next day, um, for the first time, I traveled by train to go to Hoboken to babysit for my grandson. Uh, it made all the difference in the world. I knew what I was, was supposed to be doing because of the NJ Tech program. So thank you. As you 
you heard from the first presentation, universal design is a very broad concept. And uh, some would say, how is this relevant? But it turns out that there are things that are done on the train to make it easier for older adults to get in and out. And there are discounts that you can get for riding on the train. And so you shouldn't be intimidated. And if that woman at 90 years old can have fun riding the train, trains, certainly you can have fun too. Okay. So one of the things that we advertised is that we're going to have a raffle. Well, we had the raffle. Those of you who actually signed in when you um, came to the front desk or registered, pre-registered, got um, a ticket. And um, somebody in this uh, mass of people actually picked the names out of the hat so I can tell you who the winners are. Okay, one minute. The first prize is from Montclair Film, and it includes all sorts of goodies from Montclair Film, but it also includes tickets to the Montclair Film Festival. This is valued at $150. And the winner is Mr. Rich Burns. is the Bedazzle Designs and Handcraft Beaded Jewelry by Barbara Chase, who's sitting somewhere around here. There you are, Barbara. And the winner is Masana Johnson. You know, if you don't get a chance to touch base with them here, please feel free to send me the questions and I'll make sure to share them because I'm sure some of the ideas that we've heard have actually stimulated you. But I think the most important takeaway is that it's not creativity that we're lacking, but it is sometimes overwhelming for the creative to get their ideas past the naysayers. We've got to be able to talk to the naysayers about what the future should be. So let's all think about what our role is in trying to educate people in our community, our neighbors, our councilmen and women, our thought leaders, about what the community should look like for all ages. Today, we have someone from our community who's going to actually help us understand about universal design on a micro, more micro level. Paul Sionis, who many of you know, has been an architect of many of the buildings in Montclair that we admire. Paul, through his work as an architect in New Jersey and New York, as a landscape architect in New Jersey, and as a professional planner in New Jersey, has acquired local, regional, and international experience. For Paul, framing clients' needs with environmental sensitivity is one of the most rewarding challenges. Paul has developed a keen understanding of what we call barrier-free design. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me again. Glad to see some of my friends here. So, uh, as Anne mentioned, um, I have an architecture firm in Montclair. I started the firm in 1985. My office is currently at the old Christian Science Building uh, up the street from here, right on uh, Hillside Avenue, across the street from Hillside School. We converted that from a beautiful stone church into an office building about 10 years ago. Uh, some of the other things we've done in Montclair that you might know of, uh, half a block away from here is the old Catherine Bibb School. We turned that into the Academy Square. Um, when Anne had the raffle item from Montclair Film, we converted the uh, former bank into 
headquarters for Montclair Film. Uh, I'm lucky. So since 1985, when I founded the firm, probably 80 percent of our work is, is right in Montclair. I never thought that would happen. Uh, but, but Montclair is a unique community. It's got such such a diversity um, and, and uh, is a social diversity, racial diversity, economic diversity. And as an architect, you really appreciate the architectural diversity. But there are homes and buildings here from the late 1800s up until uh, currently designed buildings, and, and it's, it's terrific. And then as a landscape architect, and as a jacket certainly appreciate, probably in the 1920s, somebody, somebody went around and planted shade trees on all the streets in Montclair. Most of those are, are beautiful, mature shade trees now. Um, some of you probably know my wife. My wife grew up in Montclair. Her parents grew up in Montclair. She's a pharmacist, a rural pharmacy. She's been there since 1973, and she will never let us leave Montclair. Um, so what, what I'm going to do is discuss uh, designs for all physical abilities, including aging in place in homes. And I'll get into uh, specifics such as the entryways, bathrooms, stairs, kitchens, laundry rooms. And I'll give a couple of case studies from, from around Montclair. Uh, I'm glad Ann mentioned street lighting. Um, you know, I, I parked my car on Frank Street the other day. There's a new restaurant called Sal's that has great gluten-free and healthy products. And I parked on Frank Street, ran in, and immediately stepped into a pothole because the lighting was so bad on the street, and I, and I twisted my foot. Um, there'll be some redundancies of what most of us will talk about, and I think that's a good thing because the more you hear something, the more you'll remember. Uh, and also, uh, just before we started, uh, we were talking about the fact that it's just it's not just the property taxes that will um, prevent people from staying in Montclair, but, but it's it's their homes. Um, it's the homes that uh, don't allow them to stay. So first is, is universal design, and, and um, Steve and Jack described this. So I was asked to talk about universal design as it relates to, to the uh, home design. Uh, and and basically universal design is, is, is pretty general, and it's to, to um, make it better for the entire population. So it's, it's not only just for uh, barrier-free accessibility, but it's also for social participation, get people outside to make people healthier, improve human performance. Um, so in universal design, our goal is to accommodate a wide range of, of body sizes and abilities. And as you can see on this photo, you know, there's every height hand dryer because people come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, not everybody has the same height, not the same weight. They don't have the same ability to reach to something or the same ability to see or, he or hear clearly. And, and I have to step back historically, how did we get into the universal design and we're discussing it? So, so historically, we never discussed universal design. Um, however, throughout the 20th century, thousands and thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people fought for injustices to those with disabilities. And that led to the ADA, or the American with Dis uh, Americans with Disability Act, which, uh, which was formalized in 1990. And through that ADA, that produced a series of design standards or guidelines that designers use today. And again, they're, they're general because they can't accommodate everybody. Again, everybody's different shape and size. But standards were set in place um, to allow for uh, designing buildings. And then we also use those standards for aging in place in home design. Uh, we talked about, uh, most of you have heard of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it's basically a civil rights law to prevent discrimi discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Um, so, so we refer to the ADA quite a bit, but we also refer to uh, code standards that were produced as a result of the ADA. Universal design has not always been at the forefront of design, with certain exceptions. Uh, most of you are familiar with the Guggenheim Museum. This was a great attempt to provide access inside of the museum without steps. Uh, you know, this was built in 1959. It was designed again in the 1930s, but it took almost 20 years to get it constructed. Uh, but this, this is a good example of universal design even before the ADA. Uh, the next slide. Um, I, most of us have favorite designers or architects. One of my favorite architects in history is, is um, Antoni Gaudi, who's an architect from Barcelona in Spain. And he, he lived in the late 1800s, early uh, 1900s. 
Um, many of you, if you know his work, are familiar with the Sagrada Familia, uh, which is his famous uh, cathedral in Barcelona. They started building it in 1900. Um, supposedly, it'll be finished but, um, in another 20 or 30 years. Um, it's, it's taken a long time, but he designed it according to nature. All of the columns are based on the design of, on, on what tree trunks actually look like. Uh, he played with natural light. Uh, but he also studied shapes of people, people's bodies. So on the top left slide, you can see uh, some of the benches that he designed. And he actually studied and measured people's backs to see where the arch in their back was, what would make it comfortable to sit on the bench. Uh, so you can see the arch, arch shape um, or the, in the lumbar area of, the, of that bench. He also, um, in particular, really studied people's hands and how easy or difficult it was to open doorknobs or to push doors open. So he spent a lot of time designing door levers, lever handles, and, um, and pretty much the one that's up there, the, uh, the brass one, um, is, is one that, that he used quite often, that he felt that was um, easily accessible to most people. So how did we get to where we are today with universal design? Um, so, so since I've been in Montclair, moved here in 1979, there are many houses that are repeats of each other, and that's because they were very comfortable to look at people like the way they were. Builders, certain builders, had a, a pattern book for houses. So in several streets in Montclair, for example, um, where my wife grew up on Cambridge Road, in the bottom left, there's a lot of houses that are, that are identical. There's center hole along the houses, and they either have a one-story porch on the left side or the right side of the house. Along the North Mountain Avenue, which is one of my favorite streets to drive on because so many of the houses are different, but they're, they're interesting. Um, yeah. They're very similar, Santa Hall Colonial. Most of the houses in this town are designed to have, or in, also in Glen Ridge and Verona, the, the architecture is pretty similar. Most of the houses have three to five steps to get up to the front door, and that, that's because um, Historically, you design for monumentality. So when you think of churches, people, or Greek temples, they designed to be closer to heaven. So, so they did that with home design, too. They always had several steps to get up to the first floor. Practically speaking, in New Jersey, we designed to have several steps because of snow and rain. We also uh, lift the houses up slightly to have basement windows if we have basements. But this, in my opinion, these are typical houses for Montclair, Verona, and Ben Ridge. So when, when these were built, typically in the late 1920s, 1930s, we didn't think, or the builders didn't think in terms of universal design. There's been a steadily growing demand to incorporate universal design into home design over the last three years, and quite a few architects now specialize in universal design. We're lucky enough, we're working with an architect, Sarah Susanka. Sarah had a 100-person architecture firm in Minneapolis, uh, she, she wrote a book called The Not-So-Big House, and from that, her career took off um, uh, designing and lecturing on The Not-So-Big House, which grew into The Not-So-Big Lifestyle. She does lectures all over the world now. From that, she left her firm in, in Minneapolis, started all over again in Raleigh, North Carolina, and concentrates on aging in place. So. Um, a couple from, who grew up in Montclair, went to high, Montclair High School with my wife, purchased property in Bernersville, New Jersey, and asked me if, we, if I minded working with Sarah on a new home, because they wanted to truly age in place. Um, so Sarah's a, a wonderful person, uh, and she's, she's written many articles on aging in place. She talks about um, you know, placing the master bedroom on a, on a main level, if possible, um, if you can't uh, put the master bedroom on the first level, at least design the house so in the future it can be made into uh, the master bedroom. Make sure that the doorways are wide enough for wheelchair access in case that ever becomes a need. She, her personal opinion is that even though the doors should be three feet wide, she doesn't like the way they look, so she always recommends two feet, ten inch wide doors. Um, she always wants lever handles rather than knobs. And I'll talk about this more again. It talks about the height of of light switches and also not having um, a step into the front door. The, um, the house that was designed, which is uh, in that rendering, uh, the construction started about three years ago because she keeps changing her mind. She flies up from North Carolina and will change details around windows, she'll change things in the kitchen. The kitchen was designed to have movable countertops. 
so that as the homeowners age, uh, the heights can change. It's designed to have um, home health care professionals live in the house in the future. Um, everything was designed so that this couple um, can stay there the rest of their life. The, um, there are certain steps for universal design that, that report that I'll go through. And the first is to make your entryway uh, safe. So, so lighting is key. Uh, so light should be installed by, near, or above all of the doors of, of a home. Uh, LED fixtures have come down in price tremendously. And they provide a much better spread of light than in most incandescent bulbs ever could. And they also last for years. And the beauty of that is you don't have to get up on a ladder to change a light bulb. Uh, the picture on the right is, is, is uh, near my front door, and those are sealed fixtures where you can't even change the light bulb. But it was probably like a $30 fixture that was made to look like a, a, you know, a fixture that might have been $100 or $200 years ago. So the key is, is make your entryway safer and start with lighting. Uh, next thing that's gotten very popular and has come down in price significantly, significantly are video doorbells. Uh, we usually put this in our specifications in home design, and quite a few people uh, now are, are purchasing these. As you can see, or you probably can't read it, but on the top, you know, this was $199 at Amazon. And basically, it, it connects to your cell phone, so you could be anywhere, um, and on your cell phone, you could see who's at your front door, who's walking up the steps to your house. You could, you could be on vacation, and you'll see who's there. You could be um, you know, upstairs on the second floor of your house, and you don't want to go down the stairs to get to the front door, but you know, the video doorbell will let you see who's there, will let you speak to the person, and either unlock the door or, or say, you know, come back or leave the package. So these are very popular and inexpensive. Making the, sa the entry safer also includes some type of roof overhang. Um, the beauty of Montclair and Glen Ridge and Corona is that if you look at many of the houses from the 20s and 30s, they have beautiful roofs over the front doors. And, and I always talk about drive up and down Ridgewood Avenue in Glen Ridge, and you'll see probably 100 choices of front porches. Um, so it's, it's important to have a covered, well-lit roof entry. Um, Especially, you know, no steps is first choice, but as I said in the 1920s and 30s, most of the houses here were not design, designed with no steps. There were always three to five steps. However, um, you know, having the, the roof and the lighting allows you to stand there in the rain, you know, get your key out, you know, unlock the front door, put your packages down. Steps and handrails. Um, so steps on the outside of your house always should be at least three feet wide. And they should have handrails on both sides of the steps so, you could, you know, uh, so it's easier to get up and down the steps, not only you know, getting up the steps, but sometimes getting down the steps, you need to hold on to both sides. And the handrail should extend beyond the top and bottom step. Uh, so, so we always try, and, and in the ADA it requires that the handrail extends at least 12 inches beyond the lower step and 12 inches past the top step. And then in the bottom photo, uh, it shows that Ideally, you should have an inner graspable, graspable handrail uh, just inside of the guardrail and the balusters with an inch and a half of space uh, between that graspable handrail and the balusters so you don't hit or scrape your knuckles. The handrail should, should usually be round. The, the code allows us to do rectangular shaped handrails, but, but really for, for uh, universal design, it's much better to have the handrails round. Uh, so according to the, the ADA, uh, the handrails should be, you know, one and a quarter to two inches in diameter. Uh, they should be round so they're easy to grab onto. They should be uh, one and a half inches from the wall or from the balusters. Um, but basically, they should at least be one and a half inches clear of anything and, and make it easy to grab onto. Uh, we'll, we'll hear more about this from, uh, I think, the, the next speaker or the video, but um, what if the steps have to stay? And this is pretty typical in Montclair. Um, you can't remove the front steps. So, so there are many, many choices. Uh, and this one is an example of a residential vertical platform lift. Um, you use it similar to a mini home elevator, but this is for the exterior of the house. It's often called a porch lift. Um, it, it's pretty low cost. Uh, it allows you to put a scooter or a wheelchair right on this lift and get up to the front, front uh, entry to your house. 
And the thing is, not everybody has room to do this, and then not everyone likes how it looks, but sometimes this is one of the only choices. These are examples that you've probably seen in Montclair. Uh, what if the steps have to stay? The, the picture on the left is, is on North Mountain Avenue, and um, a temporary ramp was installed to get from the sidewalk, the public sidewalk, to the front porch of the house. There was no other way to, to get to that front porch. And then this house on Grove Street, uh, we had renovated the interior of the house several years ago for the homeowner when she had a, um, her physical health deteriorated. So she put a, a stair lift um, right on the front of her house by the front steps, and at least it, it, it could accommodate a wheelchair, a scooter, or, or a walker. Um, what if the steps have to stay? So this is, um, most of you know this is the Van Vleck house. The Van Vleck, uh, Howard Van Vleck lived in this house as a single family house in Montclair until he passed away in the late 1980s. Uh, we were hired to uh, convert this house to a not-for-profit uh, center for the Montclair Foundation uh, right after Howard passed away. And they, they did not want to see a ramp to get into the, the house. Uh, so the front, front of the building is three steps to get into the front door, but what we were able to do was raise the, the driveway on the side of the house to make it level with the entry on that west side of the house. And that, that's become the main entry, but no one knows that the entire driveway was raised up by about 24 inches just so people in a wheelchair could get right into the building now. The doors and door hardware. Uh, if your entry door is too narrow, you really need to look at remodeling your doorway so that it's 36 inches wide. I said that Sarah Susanka, the architect, doesn't mind if it's 2 feet 10 or 34 inches, but I've, I've spent a lot of time following people in wheelchairs, measuring their knuckles, and, and you really should have a 36 inch wide doorway. Uh, the house I live in is, is an old farmhouse in Montclair. Our front door was 2 feet 8. We could, and we, we Removed it and put it in a 36 inch doorway about uh, five years ago. Wasn't, wasn't that expensive, luckily. Uh, but, but basically, by enlarging the size of the front door, it makes sure that everyone, including those with a cane, wheelchair, or walker, could easily enter and leave the home. And, and the other important thing is don't forget to have a, a lever handle. So, lever handles, as I showed you the photo um, that uh, Gowdy, the architect, study people's hands and lever handles. Um, lever handles are pretty inexpensive and it's well worth uh, removing your old round knobs and installing lever handles. It, it's so much easier to open a door without having to grasp and twist a, a round knob with your hands. And, and those movements get really difficult once you have arthritis. And the other thing is you know, the practical side. You can use your elbow to push down on the lever to open, open a door if your hands are full. But again, the prices have come down. It's probably hard to see on the screen, but uh, there's one brand that we call for a lot. That's Emtek, E-M-T-E-K. You know, for $99 or $100, they have quite a few choices of, of lever handle hardware that can replace your old round, round knobs. Besides the lever handles, uh, we're mostly designing homes with keyless entries. Uh, it, I, I, I've lost my key. Um, I, I hate fumbling for a key in the dark when I when after the work late at night. Um, so keyless entries have also come down in price. It's a, basically a touch, touch screen, a flat touch screen. Uh, you're given a code, uh, and once you punch the code in, everything lights up and um, the door unlocks. So it, it eliminates you from having to carry a key around with you, um, and also um, you know, eliminates having to twist a key uh, in a lock before you can enter or leave your home. So, so this, this is another one that's also made by MTech brand. I think this was about $150 just for the keyless, uh, keyless lock. Light switches and outlets. Um, I, I don't, you know, most people don't have a hard time with a typical light switch, but uh, some of our clients have had difficulty uh, flipping up the switch or turning them down. So we've been replacing a lot of light switches with motion sensor switches. Uh, so the motion sensor switch on the, on the center photo there, uh, basically as soon as you walk into the room, the light comes on. Uh, after you've been out of the room for you know, 10 or 15 minutes, lights go off in case you forget to turn the switch off. 
But the other choice is to install rocker switches. So rocker switches are, also you can use your elbow to turn the light switches on or off. Uh, they're the same price as um, the, the conventional flip switches. Um, another important thing are the outlets. Uh, the building code requires that we put electrical outlets at 18 inches above the floor. However, if you're laying in bed and you want to charge your cell phone, you don't want to reach under the bed to, to um, you know, to plug into an outlet 18 inches above the floor. So we, we always show outlets just at, at um, the height of a, um, a, a bedside table. Um, so this way, you know, if you're laying in bed or sitting in a chair, you can easily access that outlet to plug your phone in. Um, also, the important thing, as I wrote at the bottom, is it's important to have a wire management system. So it's easy to have a, a lot of wires that get messy, that you trip on. So wire management systems could be as simple as, as Velcro that ties all the wires together and keep them tight against the wall. But the main thing is to prevent a, a tripping hazard. Door saddles. Um, I, I never think of the fact that door saddles are a real tripping hazard. Uh, we've had uh, a client recently had all the door saddles removed in her house, and this is on the bottom right photo. So door saddles are, are the, you know, the wood, uh, raised wood uh, area between two rooms or underneath the doorway. They're usually three quarters of an inch high. Sometimes they, uh, they're necessary to, as a transition between two different types of flooring, uh, but they're difficult uh, for people to cross over uh, as you get older, especially with a walker, cane, or wheelchair. Um, so in the bottom right is, is again a house in Montclair where they just had all of the saddles removed, but I was surprised to see that they still had a throw rope there, which is, which is an extreme uh, slipping hazard. Interior steps. So interior steps, the same rules apply as for exterior steps. So steps ideally should have handrails on both sides, uh, so you can uh, help yourself up the stairs or, or down the stairs. Um, this handrail should extend past uh, the bottom and the top of the stairs. On the top two right photographs, it shows um, you know, the wooden handrail that extends 12 inches past the bottom. And then on the uh, top right, that image uh, is a metal handrail that extends 12 inches past the bottom step. And then the other thing that, um, that's important is, is good lighting. So you could purchase these very inexpensive adhesive-backed LED lights. You can purchase them online. You can purchase them at a local hardware store. They have motion sensors so that when you step, uh, go up the stairs, they come on uh, as you're rising up the steps. They're, they're down to a few dollars each. They take three AAA batteries, but they make the steps a lot safer, especially when your vision starts to diminish. Vertical access through the house. Um, most. Most houses that were built in the 20s and 30s are, are two stories uh, with a lot of steps. Uh, we'll hear about, more about this from another presenter, but uh, we've worked on a lot of houses where we put chairlifts in. Chairlifts ride along the side of the steps. Uh, they're easy to operate. The, the difficulty of this chairlift in particular from this house is it cannot accommodate a wheelchair or a scooter, but the owner, in this case, is able to carry her, her, her dog and also a laundry basket up and down the stairs. Home and personal elevators. People think these are really expensive. They've also come down in price. Um, you know, we, we've done this more and more uh, in houses we've worked on. They usually fit within the space of a closet. In, in the case of this house, uh, we had to have uh, one space lined up on the second floor with the space on the first floor. It was a five foot by five foot closet and we removed the closet and installed the new personal elevator. Um, they're, they're electrically operated. They, they travel up and down, usually a vertical track on the wall, and they can accommodate a wheelchair with one or two other people, uh, sometimes a home health uh, care worker or, or even a spouse could, could stand next to the wheelchair. Uh, the downside of the home uh, or personal elevators is that they can only go a maximum of 25 feet vertical travel distance. So most houses, the limit in Montclair is, is 35 feet. So 25 feet is fine for most, most houses, but that's uh, one of the only restrictions. Bathrooms, uh, goal is to make the bathroom safer, uh, to make it comfortable, make it easy to use as, as your needs change as you age. Um, the sink, you, you, just like with the doors, the sink should all have lever handles, to, uh, lever handle faucets, and also, the uh, sinks should allow your knees to get under the sink easily. 
uh, if you're in a wheelchair. There are many, many different faucet and shower heads available. I took this right off the website. I think this is from Home Depot, for example. Uh, just like with doors, uh, to have a lever handle on a sink or a shower head, it makes it so much easier to control. They've come down in prices uh, tremendously. Toilets. Um, over the years, people have learned what works and what doesn't work with toilets. Um, you know, in certain countries, there's still squat toilets shown on the top left. Those are almost impossible to use as, as you age. Um, I, I learned that uh, my house originally had an outhouse and, um, you know, right behind the house. I can't imagine like walking outside in the winter to use it, but that, that was typical you know, before the you know, 19, early 1900s. Um, now, almost every toilet we, we specify is uh, the toilet shown in that center photo, which is an elongated ADA height toilet. So, so the bottom left shows the code standards. So there are standards for how high a toilet seat should be to make it comfortable for someone for universal design. But if you don't have that toilet or you can't, you know, don't want to spend the money to you know, buy a $300 toilet, you can retrofit an existing toilet. So the, a uh, photo in the top right is a package from a, a toilet seat extender. These are sold at, at most pharmacies. You can buy it at Grove Pharmacy. Uh, so for $25 or $30, you can raise the height of your toilet seat to make it easier to get on and off of. Showers uh, in your bathroom. Uh, increasingly popular for home design, particularly in houses we've worked on, are roll-in showers. So roll-in showers, that means no step, people can roll right in with a wheelchair, and the floor of the shower is designed to slope to a, a shower drain away from the floor of the bathroom. Most people, when, when they first heard of rolling showers, thought, well, the water's going to get all, all over the bathroom floor. But the floor of the shower is designed to slope away from the bathroom floor. Um, these, are, these are two bathrooms that, that we did in the last two years, both for uh, people who, in Montclair who who did not need these yet, but they wanted to design this for the future. The one on the, on the bottom left is interesting because it has a double shower door so that when the day comes that they have a home health care worker, if, if the user of the shower falls inside the shower, sometimes people fall against the shower door and they can't get out and the home health care worker cannot open the door. So this is a, a double shower door that completely opens the corner of the shower. Uh, and then we've, we've used that a couple times now. Uh, it's good to have a, sh a seat inside the shower. Sometimes uh, there'll be a permanent seat or a bench, like a stone bench like the center photo. Um, and sometimes people would prefer to have a, a portable water resistant seat like the photo on the bottom right. And, and it's important to have the shower controls at this seat level so you can control the overhead shower plus a handheld shower. Bathtubs, uh, very popular in the last 20 years have been these freestanding bathtubs. Uh, most of the houses in Montclair had clawfoot bathtubs. Uh, many people have eliminated those. Um, either the, you know, they, they deteriorated or more importantly, they were difficult to get in and out of. But they became very trendy again, uh, again in the last 20 years, especially the top left or center photo. Uh, people want that in their master bathroom and they usually have that next to a shower. Uh, the top right photo is a standard bathtub that's just a, that installs right between two walls, and that, that's you know, uh, typical for many family bathrooms. But each of these has become increasingly difficult to get in and out of. So you'll see a lot of late night TV ads or in the back of the New York Times Magazine section is always an ad for walk-in tubs. Uh, the ads are everywhere. The beauty of the walk-in tubs is that it has a watertight door that allows the bather to step inside the tub over a low threshold. Uh, the door closes, the tub fills with water, and then when you're done with your bath, uh, you actually have to empty the water, wait for the water to drain before you can open the door, otherwise the water will spill out onto the floor. So certain, certain of these walk-in tubs actually have wide doors that allow you to transfer from a wheelchair right into a seat in the tub. So, so there's pros and cons to these. Um, we haven't used many, mostly because of the cons. But the pro is that it allows up to a four-foot water depth, depth. So you can sit inside the bathtub and be fully immersed in a bath. Um, but the big con is the time it takes to fill it. So you have to get inside the bathtub, you have to sit down, 
fill the water, adjust the water temperature, play with the water temperature, not burn yourself or not have freezing water come out, and, and wait for it to fill up. Uh, and that's a big con, and most of our clients have decided not, not to go with this. Um, you know, they do have built-in handrails, they have wide doors, and they have low entry uh, heights to get in. But um, so far they haven't been popular. Laundry equipment in your house. The, um, most of us had washers and dryers that were top loaders where you have to reach in to get the clothes out of the washer or the dryer. That, that's difficult uh, as you age. So it's important to switch to a, a front load washer and dryer if possible. Um, the photo on the left is a display from Costco and Clifton I took two weeks ago. And um, the, the front load washer in the center has come down in price quite a bit. However, you can't just have the front load washer by itself because if the day comes when you are in a wheelchair, it's going to be too low to open that. So they sell these optional uh, pedestal bases under the washers and dryers that raises the washer and dryer up to the height that you need to reach in and out of those if you're in a wheelchair. And the pedestal bases also serve as storage, so you can sort of put different soaps or towels uh, in those pedestal bases. Kitchen faucets and refrigerators. Um, just like doors, it's important to have the right hardware for your kitchen faucets, and, and that's generally a, a lever handle hardware. That, that's first choice. The other choice is if you can get an uh, on-off uh, touch faucet where, where you touch it and it turns on. Uh, and then the third choice is a touchless one, just like you have in public restrooms where you put your hand under the faucet and, and the water comes out. As far as refrigerators, it gets difficult to open refrigerators depending on the door design. Uh, so it's important to have long and wide pull bars to open the refrigerator and the freezer, which makes it easier to open uh, as you age. Um, I want to go through a couple of case studies in Montclair. So typical image on the bottom left, typical house, as I said, built, built in the 1920s. Um, we worked on this house about five years ago. Uh, people, their children finally grew up and were out of the house. So they wanted to do uh, what they could to make the house comfortable for them. So they, they uh, uh, had us design a new kitchen and a beautiful deck on the back of the house. Um, so the front of the house, again, typical house, five, you know, typical many houses around here, the five steps to get up to the front door. Back of the house had that porch, that open porch in the back of the house. Um, so again, it wasn't, so typical, you know, the top left photo was, is half of that side porch. The bottom left photo was an open part of the rear porch that they constantly enjoyed. Uh, they had exercise equipment. And then um, about two years ago, the homeowner uh, came down with the, uh, her health start to deteriorate. And they made the decision to, they, they wanted to stay in the home. They loved the home. They loved the, the neighborhood. They loved Montclair. So as it says, as, you know, the AARP did a study that 80% of adults want to stay in their current home and their communities as they age rather than moving to a new home. Um, but sometimes changing physical uh, abilities require homeowners to make modifications to their homes. So the first step they did was to modify their existing master bathroom, which was up on the second floor. Uh, you can see on the, the slide on the right and slide on the left, they put a tension-mounted pole that had grab bars. Uh, so this allowed them to, to use the bathroom and get to the sink a little easier. On the top left photograph is a grab bar placed on the door uh, trim outside the bathroom door, and then they put a, a uh, temporary portable seat within the shower. They also had difficulty using the toilet. Uh, as her health was deteriorating, uh, she had a very difficult time cleaning herself uh, after using the toilet. So they were able to purchase a product that Toto makes called a washlet, and it basically sits on top of the toilet seat. It rises, raises the height of the seat, um, but it also has a bidet that's part of it. Uh, so it's able to uh, provide washing, it has soap, it has a dryer. Um, and and this, this worked for, for a while uh, and let the homeowner uh, stay on the second floor of her house uh, where she wanted. However, it wasn't enough, and they decided going up and down to the second floor even with the chair it was, was just too difficult. So we were hired to look at what could they do in the house so, so they can stay in the house. 
So the plan was to take that first floor porch, similar to many houses in town have, uh, and convert it to a, a master bedroom and a, a bathroom that's totally uh, designed for universal design. So the top left is, uh, again, uh, or is becoming a master bedroom, the bottom left is becoming a, a full bathroom with a, uh, a roll-in shower, a toilet with the correct seat height, um, uh, a sink that you can roll under with a wheelchair, and also have that circle on the right drawing is a five-foot diameter circle, which is what's needed when you're in a wheelchair to be able to turn around in a bathroom. Um, we did studies to look at each wall in the bathroom, how high the grab bar should be, um, where the windows would be, you know, the height of the toilet, um, you know, the shape of the sink and vanity. Um, but she also wanted to be able to get in and out of the house. They had just three years ago installed a beautiful water feature at the rear of the house that they loved looking at. So it was important that they, they see the water feature from inside the house. So the top drawing shows new glass French doors that would let, let her look out from the bedroom right through the bathroom to the water feature. But then we also had to design a, a new rear stoop that would allow her to get from this rear entry down to the driveway. So it's a wood frame ramp uh, with grab bars on both sides that uh, will allow the homeowner to um, get down to the, the driveway level and up to the rear of the master suite. As I said, we had just designed this, this beautiful deck um, with sliding doors from the kitchen to the deck several years ago. She couldn't get through the sliding doors anymore, so uh, the contractor had to modify, remove the sliding doors, and put uh, one custom-sized door that would allow her to be able to wheel out of the door towards the deck. Um, had to put a grab bar on this photo on the right, a grab bar to hold on to the door um, trim uh, before turn, uh, opening the door level to get lever to get out of the door. So this was these were only four-year-old French doors had to be removed and replaced with this one wide uh, French door and an easy to reach interior grab bar. Temporarily, uh, they've had to place ramps before the, this permanent ramps are finished. Uh, they've placed uh, temporary ramps to get from the deck to the driveway. They're, they're not attractive, but it, it works and they're able to get from the kitchen to the deck, from the deck to the driveway. Uh, and then when the, the ramp from the rear of the house is, is completely finished, they'll get rid of the temporary ramps. They also install the temporary, well, if it's a permanent ramp, to get from the kitchen, a top right photograph, to get from the kitchen to the deck. The, uh, the deck was designed to be two steps down from the house. There were about snow sitting on the deck getting into the kitchen but now she could not get from the kitchen to the deck. The construction's in progress. Um, they put in all the modifications in the second floor so they could live there for now until this work is done. Uh, it, it'll be beautiful, but you know, it's, it's not for everybody to, to be able to afford to do this. The, uh, we've done another house on Christopher Street in Montclair. The same thing, uh, Center Hall Colonial, the right side of the house was a one-story uh, porch. Uh, but we modified it to have a the front of it became a master bedroom. This was all an open screen porch previously, but the homeowners said, we want to stay in our house, we love the town, we have our friends here. So we completely redesigned the porch to have a master suite in the front right, and then to make it a, a bathroom at the rear of the house that, that they could age in. So this sink at the bottom, at the left photograph, they could wheel under with a wheelchair, um, the shower, I have grab bars, plus easy to operate controls. Another house we just did for a friend of mine on um, Upper Mountain Avenue, she, she wanted to uh, modify her house now. She may not ever need this, but she said, I want to design for the future. So she, again, another first floor screen porch. Uh, we uh, took out the screens, had a custom uh, round top wood doors with lever handles made it into a bathroom that was completely designed for universal design. So, so the toilet is easy to get off of a wheelchair and hop onto, uh, the sink in the center photo, lever handles, uh, you pull a wheelchair under it, and then the shower, um, it's a wheel-in shower with a bench, so, so she'll be able to use this or relatives who come and visit can use this. Just a few other quick examples. Um, I, I like the idea of raising the grade if possible. Not everybody likes the look of a of a, of a ramp in front of a building. Uh, this is the George Hotel 
used to be known as the Georgian Inn. This was a single family house built in 1915 for one of the Van Vlecks. Um, this had several steps to get up to the front door. When we redesigned this to make this into a 32 room boutique hotel uh, a couple of years ago, no one wanted to see a handicap ramp um, in front of the building. So again, we were able to raise the driveway, uh, put a, a loop or drop off driveway in front of the building uh, that's flush with the first floor so people could wheel right into the front of the building. Another example was the Presbyterian Church in Upper Montclair, a beautiful church. Um, they had several members who, who had physical disabilities. They did not want to put a ramp in front of, of their church. Uh, we redesigned the front of it, raised, uh, raised the height to be flush with the floor level of the church, uh, put a, I think, a very nice uh, loop driveway with, with pavers to look like a little stone so that people could drive up to the front of the church, no, no steps to get into the church. But again, another example of raising the grade. I don't know if anyone here lives in the Parkway House in Glen Ridge, but we did a lot of studies for the Parkway House. The Parkway House is a, a multi-unit building on Bloomfield Avenue um, in, in Glen Ridge, just west of Ridgewood Avenue. And the Parkway House, as the photograph on the right, uh, when it was designed, they had elevators in the building, which makes sense, but you have to go up three steps to get to the elevators, uh, which didn't make sense. Um, so uh, the photograph on the right shows the three steps to get from the main lobby to the hallway that takes you to the elevator. We, we were hired to do a lot of studies to look at um, chairlifts, to try to have something where people would wheel into this chairlift uh, to get up to the level of the hallway so they could then walk or wheel to the elevator. Um, they, they felt it was too institutional looking. We tried different studies. Um, we looked at interior ramps. No one liked, liked the look of that. Um, and there was a big committee involved with, with a lot of strong opinions. So the end result was they, they extended the handrail. It doesn't meet the needs of people who are in wheelchairs or walkers. It helps people to grab onto the handrail, but it still doesn't help people get to the elevator, unfortunately. They, they say they're going to do it eventually, but, but not yet. Um, multi-family dwellings or multi-family houses. Um, not, not everyone can stay in their house, and, and a lot of times uh, a multi-family building might be, might be the right case uh, for, for many of us. Um, you, know, you don't want the care of your lawn and landscaping, you know, plowing, shoveling snow, painting the outside. So, so there are a lot of good multi-family buildings in Montclair that, that you know, we've done in the last 20 years at least. Um, this example, um, right across from where Adriana, well, a block away from where Adriana lives, this was um, 21 townhouses that were built in 2001. Of the 21 townhouses, 15 of these have elevators, and most of them have universal design features. So people living here, even though these are three-story buildings, uh, they all have, uh, they're all adaptable or accessible on the interior, so you can easily live here for the rest of your life. The, um, another, two other multifamily examples. Not everybody likes the idea that there's new construction, new large construction going on in Montclair, but it does fill a need for barrier-free housing. Um, these two are, the one on the left is probably about 80% done. That's down uh, diagonally across the street from Glenfield School. That's called the Vestry. Uh, that will have 46 apartments in it, all different sizes. It's expected to be finished uh, by the end of this year. Um, the units are all either accessible or adaptable. So accessible means they're ready now for people um, walk with walkers, canes, wheelchairs, uh, can easily live there. Um, adaptable means that it can become uh, made into um, an accessible unit by removing a panel on the front of the kitchen ca uh, cabinet uh, so a wheelchair can pull. The building on the right, um, they started the construction about two months ago, this is at the corner of North Willow Street and Glenridge Avenue. Uh, this will be 18 units. Again, um, there'll be several you know, uh, units that are completely accessible for people with disabilities, uh, but all the units will be adaptable where, where it's a matter of removing the front panel on the kitchen cabinet uh, or uh, in the bathroom. Uh, but all of them are designed so that someone can use, people can use the bathrooms and the kitchens, get in and out. Uh, both uh, are elevator buildings, parking on the, the ground floor. So again, it's not, hasn't been popular, and many people don't like the idea of large buildings being built on Bloomfield Avenue or, or even the one on the right on Glenridge Avenue, but it, 
does, does feel a need, and many of us who may not be able to stay in our homes or can't take care of our homes, we might want to live in places like this. A smaller example is this house on Plymouth Street. Uh, many of you probably knew this as Dr. Groyser's gastroenterology office. So this was a single family house built in 1918. In the 1950s, the gastroenterology group uh, bought the house, uh, got a variance to convert it into medical offices. It stayed as a gastroenterology office until about two years ago. Um, eventually, our client bought it and said, um, I'd like to make this into quality housing, but, but three units. So not, it was pretty big to have one single family house. So he was able to convert this into three beautiful dwelling units, uh, elevator, put an elevator in so that the second and third floor is easily accessible by an elevator. Um, did a really nice job of landscaping on the outside, and he made these as condominiums. Some buildings are going to be rentals. This one in particular was condominiums. He had a bidding war because people wanted to live here where they could walk to the downtown. It was an accessible building uh, designed for universal design. And um, on the table in the back, I have handouts. So the next three pages are from uh, the AARP guidelines for aging in place. So universal design has the benefit of allowing people to age in place. And AARP has put together guidelines that most of us should be familiar with, or at least you have some knowledge of uh, if you decide to stay in your home or design a new home. And um, as I mentioned, my, my first degree is in my first degree is in landscape architecture from Rutgers. My second degree is in architecture from Pratt. And um, the photo on the right is, is my favorite trait. And it's not a bingo trait, as I sometimes say, but it's a shadow service berry. And the beauty of a shadow service berry is that it's a tree for all seasons. Uh, so in landscape design, and um, it's another story, but <laughs> in landscape design, you always want to design the landscape so that it's interesting all year round. So it's not just um, you know pretty spring flowers or a good fall color. But you want to make sure something's happening all year round. So the shadow of service berry you know, has great spring flowers. It has then there's June berries that are attractive to birds and wildlife, uh, and then this beautiful fall color. It's a yellow bronzish fall color. But then when the leaves drop, it's this beautiful shape to the tree, a clump. Uh, Pump shape to the tree. So just as in good landscape design as architects, um, we really need to design for all seasons of life, uh, whether it's single family or, or multi-family design. And then, Anne, I think you wanted to maybe mention one more thing, right? Yeah. What do you consider the impediments to universal um, design and adoption? Uh, uh, right, so, so impediments, what do I consider impediments to universal design or adaption of universal design? Um, so, so number, number one has been cost, uh, and then number two has been lack of motivation on the part of many developers for multifamily housing. Um, so as I said, showing the pictures of the multifamily buildings, not everybody can or wants to stay in, in their single family detached home. Uh, so many multifamily buildings might be a good alternative um, to, to your single family detached house. I mentioned uh, Sarah Susanka, the architect, and, uh, when I showed the picture of the house we're working on in Burnsville. Um, the house she designed was designed uh, to be completely uh, barrier-free, accessible, not only now, but into the future. Uh, as I said, it had nurses or home health care quarters, it had motorized countertops. Uh, some of that got cut out of the project because the owners didn't like how it looked. They, they have the financial means, they said, to change this in the future. Most people don't, but, but they have the means to, you know, in 10, 10 years from now, or five years from now, replace their countertops with motorized countertops. Um, and then as far as, so, so cost is probably the biggest impediment. And then, you know, but, but also I showed the example, many of the things are very inexpensive now. Lever handles are inexpensive, the doorbells, the video doorbells have come down in price, the little $5 lights that you can stick to your stairs. Um, but as far as the other impediment is a lack of interest by developers, um, every bathroom we design that has to accommodate someone in a wheelchair is, is fairly large. So by doing this large bathroom, it takes out space of, of the apartment that they could usually use to get another apartment. So when we work for developers, it's all about you know as many units as they can get into a project because it's more profitable. So when we do barrier-free or universal design, 
know, it cuts down on the number of, of units. So those are those are the biggest impediments. Um, I think that's it. Well, thank you very much. It's a good thing that's videotaped. You'll be able to see it on TV 34 because we have a wealth of information here and some of this gray matter can't absorb it all at once. And also, some of this old muscle tone has to be exercised. So I welcome everybody to stand up, turn around, shake the hands of somebody behind you while we queue up the next video. Hello everybody, this is Greg from Back Home Safely here to talk to you about stair lifts. So we have here, we've got a lift from Stana and Harmar and Bruno and Acorn, and they all go up the stairs and they all go down the stairs. Um, so they're very similar in, in different things, but they do have unique features. All of them help your loved ones to go up the stairs or down the stairs so they can access all parts of their house um, independently if they have the ability to. So as long as they can walk over to a chair and transfer to and from a chair, this is the answer for them to be able to access every room in their house. Um, very often people will talk about only getting carried into the house in their wheelchair being placed in one bedroom and not accessing all the other floors. Um, this is a way of, of preventing that from happening. It's a way of making it so that if someone's considering moving, they might not have to have to move from the house that they love. It's even good for someone who um, who's having an acute problem, or unfortunately if they're terminal, um, in a way that we can get put this in as a rental and make it, make it happen so that they can actually still live in their house. Um, this particular one is unique in that it has a swivel point um, at the bottom of the, of the lift but the other ones don't. The other ones, this is the final position at the bottom. So what happens is there's a footrest. Um, the other ones have manual footrests. This I actually hold a button down. You can see the footrest over here. It'll go down automatically. P push of one button over here. It'll swivel by itself. Or the other ones have a manual swivel that you actually have to push down on a lever to be able to swivel. This will go all the way up the lift. Not incredibly fast, but that's okay. So when we get to the top, this one will automatically swivel over to the side, so I don't have to push any levers or remember how to do anything. There we go. To that point. Once again, as usual, I forgot to put my seatbelt on. So um, I'll show you about the seatbelt. This one is unique and it's got a one-handed seatbelt. I can reach over with one hand, push down for those people who have trouble with one of their hands. Someone might have had a stroke and they only have use of one side of their body. Um, it only requires one hand to release it and to put it back and it tracks itself. And that's the Stana. Hi, this is Karen from Back Home Safely. I'm going to talk to you two today about seat lift chairs. It's, this is a chair that helps you stand up from a sitting position. Some people have difficulty standing up from a sitting position. And what this chair does is with the press of a button, it helps raise you up. So the exertion from going from a sitting position to a standing position is a lot easier. You can be sitting with your legs up or sitting and watching TV. And you can also be lying down if you wanted to take a nap. So this is a great product for those people with some mobility issues. Thank you. It's Karen again from Back Home Safety. Hello, everybody. This is Greg coming back to talk to you about grab bars. This is something I am super passionate about. Um, just an installation of a simple grab bar by the toilet or in the shower can really prevent a fall that can change your life forever. So um, there's different sizes and shapes of grab bars. Um, the important thing to think about is where they're placed in reference to what you need. If you're a little shorter, they should be a little lower. If you're a little taller, they should be placed higher. If you're someone who again, benefits more from pulling something, maybe doing a vertical bar is going to be more effective for you. But if you're someone who does more of a push, like this, you want to do a horizontal bar. You never want to do a, a grab bar that's vertical that's too long, because if you start slipping on the bar, you're going to keep slipping until your hand reaches the bottom here. So if this bar went all the way to here, I'd already possibly be falling. If you notice, most of our grab bars have a knurling or a peening on them, a nice textured surface that makes it so that um, when your, your hands are wet and soapy, they're not slippery. Um, some of them here, like this smooth painted rail, might be less safe uh, for someone to use if their hands are going to start slipping on it. However, a grab bar that's, that has a little bit of slickness to it 
is still better than not having a bar at all. Um, they make them all kinds of sizes and shapes and forms. And this is actually a toilet paper hole, uh, holder, a, a shelf that people can grab onto as a grab bar. Um, this is actually a, a towel holder that's, that, that can be used. Um, and this is actually one that can be mounted floor to ceiling. Um, so these are all different ways of, of installing grab bars in a way that uh, gives you somewhere safe to hold. So all you have to do is give us a call. We can come over to your house, do a free assessment, and figure out with you what it's going to need, what we're going to need to do to be able to put some grab bars in for you. Thank you so much for listening. That's okay. It's all about empowerment. You see how many creative ideas there are out there. It's just a matter of spreading the word about these creative ideas and encouraging others who have um, not exercised their gray matter to think of some new solutions for some of the problems that we face on a daily basis. Um, so I, I, I want to encourage you to stop at the desks of the vendors who are um, in the gymnasium, back home safely, Umbrella and NJ Tip and uh, the library and uh, something called My Life, so that you can ask questions of these people and find out how they came up with their solutions. All right, now, we have, as our last presentation, and I know you're getting hungry, <laughs> uh, Tom Toronto from the United Way of Bergen County. Uh, Tom has 37 years of experience working in the local United Ways in Bergen, Burlington, and Hudson counties in New Jersey. He's a board member of the NJ211 Partnership, driving implementation of the 211 Helpline on behalf of New Jersey's local United Ways and the New Jersey State Government. But he also was involved with Supporting Housing Association of New Jersey and the Suez North American Foundation. His work on partnerships with nonprofit organizations has addressed the housing crisis in New Jersey by providing safe, affordable, creative <coughs> housing solutions for families, older adults, individuals with developmental disabilities, veterans, survivors of domestic, domestic violence, and individuals experiencing home, homelessness. He has a vision for how we can provide communities that have all of the features we've been talking about and meet so many of our needs. Thank you, Tom. Come.
I'm not sure you're going to be able to see any of this, uh, but I would reference in your packets is a uh, project portfolio. We have several uh, projects that are under construction right now. 85 units of affordable senior housing being built right now in Fairland, New Jersey. Um, we are building 62 units of supportive housing in eight different buildings um, on the same site, about eight acres in Forum Park. A uh, very interesting project, part of the Green, which is right on Park Avenue, former headquarters site of uh, ExxonMobil. Uh, the headquarters of the Jets uh, are there. There are several uh, corporate uses, uh, also hotels, um, and then our project. And then right behind our project is a Pulte Homes project, which is an age-restricted 55 and older market rate project. Um, so one of the things we're hoping to do is to uh, uh, connect the parents uh, of uh, young adults with developmental disabilities who may become tenants in our project with Pulte, um, because they might like to live proximate to uh, their adult son or daughter in the support of the affordable support housing project. So some, some nice uh, interconnectedness there in terms of marketing. Uh, <clears throat> we also have a senior housing project that is under construction on the Mawa, which is a third phase of the project that we've been developing over the last couple of years that includes a four bedroom uh, group home that's been completed and occupied for folks with developmental disabilities and independent living apartments also for folks with uh, developmental disabilities and then a 13 unit senior job which is under construction now and we're, we're looking forward uh, to the interconnection between uh, those populations. One of the projects that we completed that I wanted to see if I can get to is a former school building Uh, on the lower part, uh, we uh, were given uh, for a dollar a, a elementary school in Mottdale, New Jersey, um, which we <coughs> renovated um, into 10 units of senior affordable senior housing. And then next door to that site, on what had been uh, part of the playground, uh, we built a four bedroom group home uh, for uh, young adults with autism. And that project's been open about a year now. And there's been a, uh, a nice uh, connection uh, between the seniors uh, and, and, uh, and the young men with autism. And there's also a third component to that property that we'll eventually get to uh, where we will build some affordable uh, family, uh, probably home ownership, townhouse style housing. So one of the things I wanted to suggest is there's kind of a cautionary note in terms of universal design. Um, and we found that with the uh, senior building, um, actually a couple of things. One is that we do have a video intercom system um, for folks who are visitors, and we also have a uh, pretty state-of-the-art uh, thermostat system, um, which uh, uh, digital thermostats, which I'm going to we're in the process of ripping out um, and replacing with the good old-fashioned rotary uh, thermostats. Um, because they are simply too complicated um, to use, um, constantly reprogramming. No, no, this is no judgment on, uh, on the folks who live there. It is a judgment on the technology, which is just a leap too far ahead. I'm not sure my millennial children would be able to uh, properly program uh, this thermostat. So we went a little bit too far on that. The other thing that's interesting about the school building, and by the way, of the 10, School building is from 1906, as I recall, or 1904, I can't remember it. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting about that school building is that out of the 10 tenants, three, uh, three folks actually went to elementary school in that building. Uh, so kind of a nice uh, coming full circle. So of course, the, the greenest building is the building that's already been built and then adaptively reused, and we, and we love to do that. Uh, we did that with uh, the oldest church, actually, in New Jersey, down in Brunswick, and we're always looking for um, uh, factory buildings, a lot of things that can be repurposed. Uh, they're just fun to do. They are a financial nightmare often, uh, but nevertheless, we were haunted. So one of the things we did with the uh, school in Montfield is that we retained the old tin ceiling 
um, and also the slate blackboards. So in the, uh, in the units, we were able to carve pieces of the uh, slate blackboard to create message boards at the entrance with little uh, chalk holders on the bottom and erasers. And then with the tin ceiling, uh, what we were able to do is on the two stories in the hallways, we were able to create wainscoting using the tin ceilings. Uh, we were careful in terms of the pieces that we use if there were no sharp edges, and they were very distressed and modeled, and we thought, you know, this looks good. So at one of our, at actually the first tenant meeting that we had with the seniors, and we were, uh, after we got through the uh, Michigas of the uh, thermostats um, and how difficult they were, uh, we asked them in general how they liked things, and, they, and, and I pointed out, you know, how do you feel about that wainscoting? They said, you know, that looks really great, but can't you paint it? <laughs> so, um, I guess you can't make everyone, uh, everyone happy. Um, so one of the challenges uh, that I mentioned earlier is the balance between, you know, we're, we're affordable housing developers. Having said that, um, as someone once said, there's nothing affordable about affordable housing. When we have to pay for uh, sheetrock, lumber, in some cases property, and we compete with market rate developers. Um, so putting together the pro forma um, in order to be able to build to the standard, and as you look through hopefully the portfolio, you can see that we build a particularly attractive project. Uh, uh, the populations that we serve deserve that. Um, and as the owners, uh, we're very interested in the durability. Um, so building the party board, the Anderson windows, um, saves money, we feel, in the long run um, because there's less replacement costs down the road. But the challenge, of course, is to build what is commonly known as the capital stack in the industry. And we are, uh, we are sometimes uh, a, bit of a, a bit of a double bind in the sense that we want to integrate uh, design features, um, universal design features, but then we have to deal with uh, funders um, who are uh, constantly uh, hammering at us to lower our cost of um, So <clears throat> we're not always as successful as we would like in terms of uh, integrated design. And then the other component is the difficulty that we have um, with code officials um, who are often not familiar with the populations that we serve and either, either overcompensate or undercompensate. A good example of that, and I'll close on this, is that uh, just yesterday we were at a cabinet manufacturer uh, down in Jamesburg on our project in Forum Park. And the struggle that we have is in that particular project, that supported housing project, it's going to be predominantly young folks who live there. <clears throat> ADA requirements mean that we have to build our countertops um, to uh, 34 inches as opposed to 36 inches. It seems like a small difference. But <clears throat> And the idea behind that is that, and it's a good one, which is we want folks to be able to age in place, and the funding requirements are that we build to that standard so that folks can age in place. But the truth of the matter is it's very difficult to uh, cut um, if you're standing on a 34-inch on a counter and you know, where's on your back. So what we were trying to figure out is how, and the idea came to us because we also, when we were picking countertops, we wanted to be careful where the seams were, and that's why we're at the manufacturer. Uh, so that the seams weren't in the same, um, and there's other considerations about those seams in terms of the population that we serve. So we wanted to be able to say, um, the population currently ambulatory, um, why not stagger the heights of the counters? So that some are at 36 inches, which is the height that we're all used to, some at 34 inches, and maybe even some at 32, so that there's adaptability, and it's not a little one way or the other. <clears throat> that idea, uh, unfortunately, uh, we, we, we're still going to fight for it, but the issue came down to um, the code official um, in this particular town where we're building, who was really difficult to deal with. And trying to get that code official to recognize the distinctions between those cabinet heights in terms of the population fundamentally became a conversation of is it worth it or not? Because it could lead to a delay in construction. Um, and we might not ultimately be successful, and there is an incremental of course, of cost, of course, in terms of staggering the heights of the, of the counters. So as from the development side, um, so this morning we heard some spectacular ideas um, about, about universal design. From the development side, it's not a question of us uh, profit necessarily um, or maximizing profit. 
Um, we certainly want to be cost neutral where we can not subsidize a job um, if we can possibly avoid it, although we do do that. <laughs> you know, the issue is, is how to integrate um, forward thinking ideas into our uh, program and to actually be able to build. The good news is, as you can see, we are. Um, we uh, struggle with uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank. We struggle with the Housing Market Finance Agency here at the, uh, the state of New Jersey, which is, interestingly enough, very, very uh, fashion forward in terms of green building, and we certainly agree with that, but not as fashion forward in terms of universal design, but we're, we're hoping to change the, uh, we are changing, I think, the conversation, and they are now giving us a little bit more uh, room in terms of our cost per unit to allow for the integration of some universal design. I, I think with that, um, given that it's uh, lunchtime soon, uh, I'll conclude. And thank you very much. So the, the uh, principal underwriter um, of, of what we build um, is the state's housing mortgage finance agency. Um, and, then, and every state actually has a, a most states, I guess I should say, has a housing mortgage finance agency. And, and, and their charge is to uh, aid and abet in the development of affordable housing. So they behave like a bank and they underwrite our projects. Um, we have mortgages with them. They're, they're pretty favorable mortgages in terms of, uh, in terms of repayment. Um, but we go through a, a particularly, uh, I would argue, overly arduous underwriting um, in, in terms of uh, financing uh, our projects. So the, uh, I'm not sure, and uh, just to, except to say that it's the New Jersey Housing Mortgage Finance Agency, um, that you're aware of that, I, I would say on a larger scale, uh, it's the governor's office. Um, the uh, affordable housing development in the state of New Jersey is, uh, uh, is, is a difficult enterprise to undertake. Um, and uh, I think Trenton uh, could do more in terms of uh, incentivizing municipalities to um, develop affordable housing and, and probably the, the best way to do that would be to try to move uh, affordable housing out of the court system uh, where it currently resides uh, and back into a, uh, like the Department of Community Affairs, for example. I don't know if you're aware of it, <clears throat> but um, Superior Court judges now are the arbiters of affordable housing development in the state of New Jersey um, because of the paralysis of Trenton around addressing affordable housing. It's uh, now become literally the third rail, I would say, of politics. So the struggle with having affordable housing decided at a superior court level is the extraordinary amount of money that has to be spent on planners, attorneys. It's quite a cottage industry now. Not to mention the slow, slow, place, slow pace of, of developing housing as a result of that additional um, library that municipalities, even municipalities that want to develop, and we typically work with municipalities that have invited us in because they're interested in trying to develop affordable housing. Um, it's pretty daunting. Um, so anything that might be able to untangle that regulatory uh, process and make it simpler and reward municipalities that want to be proactive and address affordable housing, I think would be welcome. Next week, okay. And the agenda is quite extensive and it is really important for municipal um, employees as well as um, township leaders to attend this conference. And I got a um, summary of what's going to be um, talked about. And to my astonishment, there's not one topic there about seniors. So we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that these issues, as Tom said, don't just become municipal issues. There are issues that can be dealt with 
and smooth the way through a statewide um, effort. So having some information about what statewide agencies are the agencies we have to speak to will be very helpful in the long run. Now, I want to remind you that not only is this video going to be on TV 34, it can always be um, watched on YouTube. You just go to the website, the Township website, go to the TV 34 page, and you'll see a YouTube link for it. Am I right? The link's on the homepage. The link's on the homepage. On the right hand corner. Right hand corner. Okay. And the other thing is we have the vendor tables, and we have a delicious lunch um, that was um, given to us by um, um, specialty sandwiches, I believe it's called. Okay, whatever the tape case is. <laughs> we hope you stay for lunch, and we have our two speakers who are available for question and answer. And thank you very much for coming.